Thanks for joining me again this week for another part of our series entitled Covenant and the Book of Daniel. Today our story is on Daniel chapter 6, and the title of the message is Confidence in Crisis, something I'm sure we would all like to have in the days in which we are living. But before we delve into our study, let's start with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we just ask for your spirit to guide us into your truth and teach us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's do a quick summary of where we've been in the book of Daniel so far. In Daniel chapter 1, Daniel is a young Jewish captive in Babylon. Jerusalem has been conquered and he along with his people are in a great spiritual crisis because of it. God had made a covenant with King David that he would always have a descendant to sit on the throne in Jerusalem, essentially promising that the Jewish people would always have national sovereignty under Jehovah. But Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, besieged and overthrew Jerusalem, and the king that sat on David's throne, the Jewish people were taken into captivity, the great spiritual crisis in their hearts and minds was over whether or not God was able to keep his covenant promise to them. The book of Daniel was written for their benefit as a message from God to correct their erroneous views and instill faith in him once again. Chapter 1 shows Daniel being faithful to the covenant and God being faithful to him in return. The lesson here is that the covenant is conditional based on the response of God's people to it. They learn that God has not abandoned the covenant, rather they have. But if they will return to him, then he will turn their defeat into victory. In chapter 2, they learn that God is ultimately in control of Babylon, the kingdom that overtook them. Not only this, they, they learn that he is the revealer of secrets and that he holds the future in his hands. In chapter 3, they learn that God is able to preserve his people through their fiery trials and that he is their redeemer. Chapter 4 teaches them that God is the one who sets up kings and removes them. He is the king of kings. They learn again what the sure results of turning away from God are, but also what the result of turning back to him will be. Chapter 5 taught them that God is a God of justice and judgment and that he will hold kings and nations accountable. Today we'll be looking at Daniel chapter 6, but we're going to start with the last verses of chapter 5. You'll remember in chapter 5, at the great feast, that King Belshazzar was getting drunk with his friends, and a supernatural, bloodless hand wrote on the wall, Mini, Mini, Tackle you Farson. Daniel was called in. He interpreted the writing in these words. God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. You have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. And now, the last two verses of chapter 5. It says, That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. So Babylon fell. The kingdom of Nabopolassar, Nebuchadnezzar, Nabonidus, and Belshazzar, the great kings of Babylon, went down. And as Babylon fell, Darius the Mede took the kingdom. Now, Daniel 6 and verse 1. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom. And over these, three governors, of whom Daniel was one that the satraps might give account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. This happens in probably somewhere around 539 BC. The former kingdom of Babylon is reorganized into 120 satraps. A satrap is an ancient Near Eastern geopolitical land division. The satrap of Palestine was called beyond the river by the Medo-Persians. The term satrap also referred to the ruler over those geopolitical divisions. They were basically governors, and Daniel was set as one of three governors over them. 
It was unusual in those days for a foreigner to be appointed to such a high position. This is absolutely incredible. Babylon falls, and as Medo-Persia takes over, the new king takes a former vice president from the previous empire, and he brings him into his empire and makes him second in command. When you overthrow an empire, usually you depose political officials. Many times in history, they've actually lost their lives. But Darius saw something in Daniel. He saw a man of goodness, a man of honesty, a man of integrity. Daniel teaches us that you can light a candle in the darkness. Even today, in a society that calls good evil and evil good, where political leaders are the basest of men, there are still those who admire goodness, who admire honesty and integrity, who will see that light if you will choose to let it shine, and they will value you for it. In ancient Greece, the philosopher Diogenes would walk down the street at night with a candle and hold it up to people's faces. When they asked, what are you doing? He would reply, I'm looking for an honest man in Greece. Today, God is looking for Daniels, men and women who purpose in their heart to serve him. One author put it this way, the greatest want of the world is the want of men, men who will not be bought or sold, men who in their inmost souls are true and honest, men who do not fear to call sin by its right name, men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the pole, men who will stand for the right though the heavens fall. God is looking today for men and women of integrity. Darius found one in Daniel, and he knew there were a lot of scoundrels around him, so he put Daniel second in command. So one empire overthrows another, and there's a new political structure. Let's take a look at the organizational structure of the newly formed empire. We see in verse 1 that Darius appointed 120 satraps. The King James Version calls them princes. And in verse 2, he put three governors over these satraps. The king named Daniel the first of these three governors. Under these three governors were the 120 satraps or princes. All the satraps were accountable to the governors. The governors were accountable to Daniel. And Daniel was directly accountable to the king. As the two other governors began to observe Daniel's appointment, jealousy and envy began to develop in their minds. Daniel chapter 6 reveals to us the legacy of jealousy. It reveals the perilous pitfalls of allowing sinful habits to grow in the heart and in the mind. Look at verse 3. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom. They were envious, and their envy led to jealousy. But the Bible says they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. They bugged his royal telephone line. They hacked his royal email. They opened his royal mailboxes. We know that everyone has got some skeletons in their closet, they thought, some dirt under their fingernails. So they examined his life with a fine-tooth comb. They checked his finances. They checked his words. They checked his ambitions. They checked his public life, and they also checked his private life. Daniel was put through absolute scrutiny. And guess what? They found nothing. Absolutely nothing. Daniel went through a miniature judgment. His life was scrutinized, and Daniel had nothing to hide. It's a wonderful thing in your life when you have nothing to hide. There's a wonderful tranquility that comes when you can go to bed at night knowing that there are no skeletons in the closet that could someday embarrass you. There's a peace that comes from knowing that your life is totally transparent before God and before people. But I want you to know that even if your life hasn't been pristine, and really, that's all of us, isn't it? I want you to know that it can all be set right with God if you will give your life to Jesus. 
God will pardon you. He will blot out your sins in this very moment if you will humble yourself before him and accept the salvation that he has provided for you in Jesus Christ. He will take hold of your life and guide your steps, enabling you to follow him. So back to Daniel. These jealous satraps and governors could find nothing with which to blackmail him. Look at verse 5. Then these men said, We shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. You see, Daniel was a covenant keeper. And the only way that the devil could get Daniel was if he somehow attacked God's covenant. If somebody condemns you because of your obedience and allegiance to God, so be it. If somebody criticizes you because you are a principled person, so be it. If the source of of ridicule is that you are principled, that you're moral, that your life is one with God, if you are ostracized for that, then so be it. And that's exactly what happened to Daniel. Look at verse 6. So these governors and satraps thronged before the king and said thus to him, King Darius, live forever. All the governors of the kingdom, the administrators and satraps, the counselors and advisors, have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. What do you know immediately about that statement? It's a bold-faced lie. What did they say? They said all the governors in the kingdom have met together. We're not going to pray to any other god except you. Now, did all the governors really meet together? Did the first governor meet with them? Did Daniel agree with them that he wouldn't pray to any other god except Darius? Not at all. Now follow this closely. Their jealousy led to envy. Their envy led to greed. Their greed led to lying. And their lying led to the willingness to put an innocent man to death. You see, sin cherished in the mind never gets less powerful in your life. It always gets more powerful when you cherish it. There's a story of a man walking through Central Park who sees a little monkey playing on the ground. The man bent over and said, What a cute little monkey. I'm going to pick that monkey up. So he did. He picked him up and put that monkey on his back. As he walked along, the monkey put his arms up to his cheek and the man said, Hey, This little monkey needs a banana. So he went out to a fruit stand, bought a banana, and gave it to the monkey. A little while later, the monkey was hungry again. So he gave the monkey another banana. And the monkey jumped off his shoulder and ran around his feet. It was wonderful. But as he kept feeding the monkey bananas, the monkey kept growing. And it got harder to carry that monkey. Over time, as he kept feeding this monkey on his back, it grew into a big, ugly gorilla. And finally, one day, it put its arms around the man and crushed him. The gorilla left him for dead as it sauntered along on its way. Drug addicts talk about the monkey on your back. They talk about how you start with a little bit, and it grows and grows like that monkey until it kills you. Sin acts in the same way. You take the sweetest woman. She comes to church every Sabbath, but she she goes home and starts criticizing the pastor's sermons. She doesn't like them. Then she starts criticizing her neighbor. Then she starts criticizing her aunt, her uncle, her husband, her children. That criticism will grow so much that it will destroy all spirituality in her life because sin cherished never gets smaller. It only grows. After 10, 20, 30 years or more, the criticism is no longer just in her private thoughts. It's pouring out of her mouth on everyone. And this is what she's known for. This is who she is now. Sin is like the monkey on your back. The more you feed it, the bigger it becomes. And the more it crushes out your life. For the satraps and governors, jealousy led to envy. Envy to greed. Greed to lying, and lying ultimately, ultimately led to attempted murder. They went on to say, Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing, 
so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. Now in Medo-Persia, when a law was signed, even the king did not have veto power over that law. The law became the master, and once you signed it, everyone had to serve that law. Therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home. And in his upper room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since his early days. He was praying towards the temple in Jerusalem, which was in shambles. Daniel had never forgotten his God, and he never forgot his people. Here he is, the covenant-keeping representative of God's people, praying and making supplication before God on their behalf. It tells us in 1 Kings 8, 48-50, that after sinning, God's people must repent and pray towards Jerusalem. We know that this is what Daniel was doing because he prayed three times a day during the time of morning and evening sacrifices and also at midday. Daniel knew that there is help in prayer. He knew who had watched over him his entire life and where his highest allegiance belonged. Daniel would not allow his job with Darius and Medo-Persia to come between his relationship with God and his even higher job as intercessor for his people. Daniel knew that God had enabled him as a teenager to purpose in his heart to serve him. Daniel knew God had enabled him to pass those comprehensive exams and to come out on top. He knew God had given him wisdom and knowledge and skill in interpreting prophetic dreams in God's word and in leadership. He knew God had delivered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fiery furnace. He knew God had enabled him to hold that empire together for seven years during the time when Nebuchadnezzar was wandering and eating grass like a cow. He knew God had enabled him to interpret the dream of the judgment and that great tree in chapter 4. He knew God had enabled him to read the writing on the wall in chapter 5. He knew God had given him the position of first governor, and he was not going to compromise now. Daniel knew that the source of his strength was his covenant with Jehovah. To Daniel, prayer, therefore, wasn't something that merely ascended to the ceiling and bounced back down. For Daniel, prayer was the very breath of his soul, the vitality and life of his being. Because Daniel knew that where there is no covenant with God, there is no power. And prayer was the vital link between him and his covenant-keeping God. So on his knees, Daniel prayed. I can almost see these satraps and governors. They go to Darius and manipulate him. When Darius signs the decree, they go running as fast as they can to Daniel's house. They're probably not in the best physical shape, I mean, they have been banqueting and drinking and eating all that rich food at the king's table. They're probably quite rotund, and they're running in their robes, panting and out of breath. And here they come to Daniel's house, those slithering snakes sneaking behind trees. And looking up at his window, they see exactly what they wanted. There is Daniel, this great giant of faith, kneeling down. There is this honest man of God, filled with integrity, with nerves of steel, kneeling down to pray. Verse 11 says, Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. The definition of supplication means the action of asking or begging for something earnestly or humbly. What we need to understand about Daniel is that he isn't making supplication on behalf of himself, but on behalf of his people. He's following the prescription in 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 49, which means that he is praying in corporate solidarity with his people. Daniel is the corporate figure for his people. He is their leader and representative. Now, this decree of the Medes and Persians is quite significant, and there are several issues with the decree. Let's look at it carefully. Verse 12 says, And they went before the king and spoke concerning the king's decree. 
Have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any god or man within thirty days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing is true, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. Notice the issues here. First, the heart of the conflict is God's covenant law versus man's law. God's law says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. The law of Medo-Persia said, don't worship anybody else but Darius. So God's law and man's law were in conflict. Second, here at the end of Daniel's life, a conflict arises over worship. And we are shown that worship is not just singing and praising and bowing down to something in a worship service. Worship is obedience. Who you worship is quite literally the person that you are obeying. Is it God or is it man? How do you worship? You worship either by following man's decree or by following God's covenant commandment. And third, there is an element here in this obedient test of time. When do you worship God? Will you put off your worship of God for these 30 days? Man's law said that for the next 30 days, you can only worship Darius. At the end of Daniel's life, he faced a test over loyalty, a test about the law of God and about worship. And what I want you to know is that at the end of time here on earth, a test will come again that's calling all men back to worship their creator. Will you take a little detour with me? Keep your finger there in Daniel and go to Revelation chapter 14. At a time called the end time, in the final hours of Earth's history, once again, the issue will be over worship. Once again, the issue will be loyalty. Once again, the issue will be obedience. Revelation 14, starting in verse 6, says this, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven. When God describes an angel flying in the midst of heaven, it's God's message going with great speed to the ends of the earth. It says, Having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. So here's a universal message. It flies across geographical boundaries. It penetrates every language group. It goes to every country in the world. And what is the message? It says, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him. The word fear there doesn't mean to be afraid. It means reverence God, giving glory to Him. For the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. The message is about respect or reverence for God. The message, the message is that we're living in the judgment hour. Worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. Worship the Creator. Give your allegiance to the Creator. A second angel comes and says that Babylon is fallen. So apparently Babylon didn't completely fall on that night when Belshazzar was partying with his court. No, the spirit of Babylon continues to exist throughout world history and reaches a crescendo in the last days. Now look at verse 9. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast... So in verse 7, it says, worship the Creator. In verse 9, it says, don't worship the beast. It goes on. Whoever worships the beast and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. Then in verse 12, it tells you what you need to do so that you don't worship the beast. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So verse 7 says, worship the Creator. Verse 9 says, don't worship the beast. And verse 12 says that those who don't worship the beast have faith in Jesus, and that leads them to obey God's commandments. The Bible is telling us that history will be repeated. In Daniel's day, a human governmental leader passed a decree that enforced false worship. In the last days, a human leader will again unite church and state and pass a decree that enforces false worship. 
Daniel 3 and Daniel 6 are parallel experiences. In Daniel 3, a powerful world leader passed a decree saying that if you do not bow down and worship the image, you will go into the fiery furnace. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were loyal and faithful. And in Daniel 6, at the end of Daniel's life, Darius passed a decree that unless you worship in the prescribed way, you will be fed to lions. In the last days, according to Revelation, there will be a similar decree. The issue will be worship. The issue will be loyalty. The issue will be obedience. Now, here's my question to you. If today we have difficulty following God in such a time of peace and freedom, if the pressures of those around us get us to conform today, how will we do in the crisis of the ages? Do you think that Daniel prepared for the final crisis of his life at the moment of crisis? Or did he prepare by choosing to follow God all along the way? Let's go back to Daniel 6. The decree went forth. The scoundrels found Daniel breaking the new law, and they, Im they immediately went back to the king. Daniel 6, 12 through 18 goes on to say this, And they went before the king and spoke concerning the, key the king's decree. Have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any god or man within 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing is true according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. So they answered and said before the king, That Daniel, who is one of the captives from Judah, does not show due regard for you, O king, or for the decree that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. Immediately the king saw what was going on. He realized he had been duped, and he set to work trying to save Daniel. Verse 14. And the king, when he heard these words, was greatly displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. The king knew that he had been deceived and he thought to himself, I want to get Daniel out of this problem. Daniel's not rebellious, but there was nothing that the king could do. And at the end of the day, the conspirators forced his hand. Then these men approached the king and said to the king, You know, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and Persians that no decree or statute which the king establishes may be changed. The law said that even the king couldn't change it. If he did, he would be deposed from his throne, and Darius wasn't willing to put his neck on the line, even for Daniel. There was nothing else that he could do except give the order. So the king gave the command, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. Darius recognized that Daniel was a servant of God, but he felt he had no choice. So they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's, desk, into the lion's den. It's an impossible situation. Hungry, vicious, ferocious lions. And that's where they put Daniel. A stone was brought. The mouth of the den was sealed. There's Daniel in some dirty, smelly lion's den. He puts his head on some stinky old lion that hasn't had a bath in years. And Daniel goes to sleep. He sleeps like a baby all night long. You know something? It's not the house that you live in that enables you to sleep. Peace doesn't come from things. Peace comes from God. It's the peace that God puts in your heart that enables you to sleep. Our Lord says, Look unto me. Perfect peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. You know, there are a lot of people in life who think, If I only had something else, it would give me peace. If I had a new house, that would give me peace. If I had a new car, that would give me peace. If I had new clothing, that would give me peace. If I had a new job, that would give me peace. If I had a new wife, a new husband, that would give me peace. But peace doesn't come from things. Peace is something inside of you. Peace is something God gives you inside your heart. You can take a Daniel and you can put him in a stinky, smelly, filthy lion's den. 
And because he has the peace of God in his heart, because he knows that what he has done is right, he and those big cats are going to lie down and sleep together all night. You can take a troubled king, and it doesn't make any difference if he's in a palace or not. He's not going to sleep at all because the environment around him cannot create sleep. Sleep comes from having peace of mind. When you know God, it gives you a peace in your heart, a peace that enables you to face unusual circumstances with confidence and with joy and with hope. If your peace or your happiness or your joy is always outside of you, dependent on the experience of a moment, then if the experience is a high one, you're going to be high. But if the experience is a low one, you're going to be low. But if your peace is not dependent on what's going on out there, but on what's going on in here, and if the kingdom of God is established in your heart, and if Christ is living in your heart, then that peace will fill your life. Sure, you might be happy or you might be sad, but that peace will remain no matter what happens outside of you. Let's go to verse 19. It says, Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. The king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths so that they have not hurt me, because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. He said, my God, don't you like that? My God, not some God, not any God. My God has sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths. Daniel went into the lion's den, but there was a lion tamer who rendered the lions powerless. There was a lion tamer, and he looks to you today. When the lions roar in your life, the lions of temptation, the lions of anger and bitterness and resentment and lust, the lions of depression, the lions of discouragement. When you've been fired from your job because of who you are and because of who you represent. When your spouse has left you. When you've been abandoned by all human support and the lions are roaring in your life. I want you to know today that God is a great lion tamer. You're facing some problem in your life today. And it's as if you have been dropped into a pit of lions. You've struggled with impatience. You've struggled with anger. You've struggled with lust. You've struggled with resentment. But you can't tame it. The lion seems to be roaring in your ear. But today, you can say, Lord, tame that lion. Lord, shut the lion's mouth. And God, the great lion tamer, will come to your lion's den and he will put all those big cats to sleep. I thank God that he tames lions. I thank God that he still shuts lions' mouths. I thank God that he still renders the big cats of my life powerless. He did it for Daniel and he can do it for you. The text goes on to say, Now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury whatever was found on him, because he believed in his God. Then we get a glimpse of just how terrible those ancient kingdoms were. It says, And the king gave the command, and they brought those men who had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, and their wives. And the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. Here we see the end of all false accusers. False accusers will receive retribution for their sins. An investigative judgment is made and accusers are condemned while Daniel is vindicated. Then King Darius wrote, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble in fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever. 
His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues, and he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. The king recognizes the supreme rulership of God. We find throughout the book of Daniel that poetry, when, it's written, when, the, when the text is written in poetry, it's proclaiming God's supreme rulership and eternal kingdom. The stories in Daniel 1-6 through 6 are not isolated from the remainder of the book. They set the themes. We find a wisdom theme there. And we learn that true wisdom is loyalty to God and to His covenant. And that false wisdom is relying on your own wisdom and being separate from God. We find a rulership theme. The question is asked, who will rule the earth? And we learn that the Most High God will rule on earth. We also see, see a human exaltation theme, that humans are constantly attempting to displace God. So how does the book of Daniel speak to the spiritual crisis of God's people at that time? Remember, the, the, the issue for the Jewish captives was that it seemed like God had not kept his covenant promises. The book of Daniel shows them that when God is recognized as supreme, the eternal Davidic covenant is a reality. It also shows them that God still has an earthly vassal and that it, it is Daniel. Therefore, the Davidic line of kings is still a reality. The message conveyed through the stories is that when people recognize God as their ultimate ruler, then temple or sanctuary, which is God dwelling among his people, is a reality. Well, we've made it halfway through the book of Daniel. I want to thank you for joining me on this journey thus far. I hope that you've been blessed, as blessed by it as I have. The second half of the book transitions to some of the most incredible, compelling, end-time prophecies in the entire Bible. In the first half of the book of Daniel, everything comes out all right in, in the end, in spite of the major crises that we find there. Daniel has all the answers and is always in complete control. But in the second half of the book, everything appears to be a disaster. Daniel has no control. Yet, everything comes out all right in the end again because of God's intervention. In the first half of the book, other people have visions and dreams, but now Daniel is going to be the one having visions and dreams. And now he's actually going to have no answers. He has to learn to be patient and wait. We're going to find that this is now added as part of the wisdom theme for God's people. The wise must be patient. And you will have to be patient for the messages in this series. There will be some weeks when we will take a break from our series in Daniel to have other sermons and messages. But keep joining us. Soon enough, we will study the next chapter in Daniel together. Thank you again for joining me today. May you find confidence to face your crisis as you remember God's covenant in your life. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you are a great lion tamer in our lives. We ask that you would help us to remain in covenant with you at all times and to be faithful to you, placing you above all others in our life. May we serve you, Lord, and be your covenant-keeping people. This is our prayer in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Thank you for joining me. God bless you. Wherever the wind blows, wherever the sun may go, you have been faithful to me. Whenever the rain falls, whenever the night calls, you have been faithful to me. Always, always, always faithful. Always, always, you've been faithful to me.
faithful to me When I turn my back to run These arrogant things I've done Still you were faithful to me So Father I'm letting go Cause even a faithless heart knows That you will be faithful to me Always, always, always faithful Always, always, you've been faithful to me Faithful to me when everything is changing all around me, you alone are steadfast, Lord. Always, always, always faithful, always, always, you've been faithful to me. Faithful to me. Faithful to me.